the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics, step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. Taylor Dane is this week's guest on Turning Point with Frank McKay. People throughout the world have been enjoying Taylor's music for more than two decades. She talks with Frank about those pivotal moments that led to her success and how people like Clive Davis changed the course of her career. She also talks about her other great love, being a mom to her 11-year-old twins. Let's listen. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome. Today, our very special guest is the very talented, the always intriguing Taylor Dane. Taylor, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. I, good morning to you. We're <laughs> we're always uh, always interested in the business of music, and you, you had a, a really fascinating start. You really started, you know, from ground floor up. And if if my my facts are right and my memories are right, you, you're from Long Island, New York, where I'm from as well. And yeah. is that right? Yes, I am. Yes, yeah. I grew up in Baldwin and Freeport, yes. And, uh, you know, I hear all the, the stories, and you're really, you know, quite a legend when you get around here because your story and your rise uh, really was a, a fascinating one. You, you had worked at, out of some smaller studios, and then uh, from what I understand, you did a, 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 a spec deal with uh, Cold City, and that's what led to, you know, the, the Clive Davis deal. But let me let you tell it in your words. Uh, go back to the yeah. beginning, if you would. Well, I mean, I graduated, uh, I was in high school in Baldwin, and um, all that, all my elementary school and whatever I was in, I, I was extremely focused, hyper-focused that this was my career. You know, I want to be a rock and roll star, if you will. Um, I was a singer. Um, elementary school, I had my solos and certain parts, and I was very determined to break in the music industry. Uh, coming from New York, you know, we had our, our stations of the PLJs, the KTUs, and, you know, I grew up listening to ABC Radio, you know, which was as top 40 as it gets. It was a big deal back AM. then. Yeah, Big deal back then. It's different. Absolutely. It was huge. Um, and it was everything in our radio station from, you know, the Karen Carpenters, the Temptations, to the Al Greens, you know, the Marvin Gaye's. That was top 40, you know, to Three Dog Night or Aerosmith even. I was a, you know, big product of the early 70s, you know, 70s. That was radio for me. Um, so for me, I really was quite determined. So I was in my first band at 16, um, was covers and things like that, probably Neil Young to Almond Brothers, whatever. But um, graduating high school, um, my first band. So we were playing... It was all original music, which was kind of a, you know, probably a new concept, but the point was that was what it was. So I was going in and out of the city. We were working in our, you know, as I said, my, my first band. So already we were looking for record contracts and trying to make noise because we were, or at least the main writers were really trying to uh, get showcases and really break. So I was doing that at 17, 18 and getting introduced to a lot of the, you know, the clubs that would, would potentially be the, uh, the grounds, you know, for a groundbreaking band, you know. And that led to the CBGBs and all that. And a couple of bands by the time I was, I guess, 20 and working in a Russian nightclub down in Brighton Beach just, you know, to pay bills, I, somehow I ended up at uh, um, ultimately Cove City, but I started out of a little studio and met Rit Wake. Um, was that Rick Beater's studio? In Merritt. Was there, was there a guy named Rick Beater? I'm sorry? Is that the right? Well, maybe Lou Bolognese's studio. Was that? Was it? Yes, that was. Yes, that was. Yes. Now, it, let me ask you, what, exactly were you what, it was. what were you singing in, in the Russian uh, nightclubs? What type of music were you singing? Uh, well, top 40 at the time, but and that was uh, basically, you know, so foreign to me because I was doing so much original music ultimately. But honestly, I was also singing a lot of Russian songs. I was oh, learning sure. them phonetically. I'd studied uh, uh, classically in my two years of college and was really working with a, a classical, meaning operatic uh, coach. I really felt that that would be a fundamentally um, challenging and also protective way to preserve my voice by having that 
background, and it was. And I had the instrument for it. I was a mezzo soprano, and uh, so that was behind the scenes. But ultimately, this my my coach, who I ended up taking off, was Maestro Corelli. He was uh, at the Manhattan School of Music, and ultimately at the uh, Met. And that's his career. But he would come to many a club and watch me perform. <laughs> Hey, kind of funny. Yeah, oh, well, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, we kind of started at 16. What if we go way back? What was the first record you remember hearing and singing and, uh, you know, really the first influence you had? Well, my biggest influence were my parents, meaning that, you know, music was played in the home, and it was usually on Sundays when, you know, my father was home and he was cooking breakfast or brunch, we call it, and it was a lot of musicals, Man of La Mancha, The Fantastics, and and they really were influential in giving me my first records, you know, 45s at, at the time, and giving me my first radio, my dad did. Um, and we were, they were big, you know, avid theater goers, my parents, truly, and like real, you know, off-Broadway. Yeah. To, you know, off-off-Broadway, which, and they introduced me to a lot of musical theater, which I just, at the time yeah I just didn't couldn't wrap my head around it and it just seemed such a I said everybody's trying too hard mom trying too too <laughs> hard yeah. but they showed me some very interesting productions we'd go to La Mama we'd go to uh, you know the Pap Theater and there I saw incredible like from Les Mis to you know Ain't Misbehaving to Liz Suedos to you know Mehmet. I mean, it was just interesting. And again, they were the most influential and they bought me my first 45s or my first albums, which were the Beatles, the Stones and Crosby, Stills and Nash, which of all, I would say Crosby, Stills and Nash is the one that hit home the most with the harmonies and the vocal prowess. And and then my first 45, I think, was probably Build Me Up Buttercup and the foundation. Yeah. What instruments did you play if any <laughs> i was in the marching band i was it was flute yeah and i played a little guitar but that was it well the flute how much uh you know how much preparation did that give you at least breath wise right i i don't know the instrument but i imagine well, i i wasn't really good at cold reading and stuff like that but i had this incredible ear so i guess more improvisational so by the time we were doing like jazz band and stuff i was doing much better doing improvisational performing so we're here technically yeah i'm sorry so good. yeah we're here with taylor dane uh taylor at, at one point clive davis hears you and i know we're missing a mm -hmm. lot of material in between but when clive davis hears you and and flips out on you uh or over you i should say uh good things are bound to happen you want to lead us to that well, basically, at that point, I've been working with Rick for a year or so. We, um, a lot of stories, you know, ha coming upon Tell It to My Heart, which was um, given to me on a cassette with a, a bunch of other songs from a friend of mine that I went to high school with at Warner Chapel and a friend of his, Warner Chapel Publishing. Rick chooses Tell It to My Heart. We go and sit down with my dad. I've done a couple of 12 inches by then under Leslie. And we go, this is the song we feel is really good and at least you know or the one that at least can cross over and you know lend us the money you know we'll pay you back and we'll get on the mix shows at least and i can go around and, you know do some of these clubs and perform we, we we thought we'd get over in the mix shows at least and ultimately that's the single that we were trying to use as the leverage to get potentially some inf you know some whatever to get out with you know Potentially the mix shows, meaning the radio stations would pick it up in the midnight specials, you know, when they're playing those. But ultimately, it got walked into Arista Records to a guy named Andy Furman, who a produce, a, basically we hired a, um, a PR, a, a pup, you know, whatever you want to call him. Yeah, um, a promoter. To uh, work the record and the dance level. But he w gave it to somebody at Arista, and Arista had Clive hear it. And I was signed. We, they made an offer on, uh, you know, on Tell It To My Heart, which <laughs> really, it was signed. Uh, we, it got passed by a couple of labels, but this particular label, which is Arista, was the home of Whitney, and, 
and really doing incredible stuff with more of Aretha because Aretha grew up, broke out with whom, Zoom and Who, and that was a real top 40 success. But it was Clive's, ultimately Clive Aris Records, that heard Tell It's My Heart and signed it for a single, single option album with me. So they released it with no photo on the cover, just the language of Tell It's My Heart and mm. funny cover. And they released it in Europe first, and it just blew up. I mean, it's one of those stories. It's just you can't, you know, rewrite it. It's exactly what happened. It blew up, and nobody saw it coming. And they had no record in the can. They had nothing. I, I was just like, gonna, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Clive met me or heard me sing live and was like, "This is the most outstanding voice." They had a single. They bought it for kind of nothing, and so it was blowing up. And they had no album in the can. Because you know, there's only so far you can go on singles. It's albums. That Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. And that's when the real story begins. I was just going to ask you, how much material did you have backing you up after that? I mean, did you have, uh, you know, residue from your old bands or was that usable or? No. Basically, during, you know, for a couple of years, Rick and I have been in the studio playing. But, you know, I met a bunch of songwriters and writers and, the same writer of Tell It's My Heart we ultimately used for the second single, which was Prove Your Love. Seth Sawarski and Ernie Roman and just goes on. But yeah. And I had worked with another uh, writer, um, and she was one of the writers on Don't Rush Me, because I was doing a lot of session work, you know, paying some bills. But mm -hmm. I'll Always Love You and then the rest, you know, putting the album together was a real quick, and, you know, that's when Clive came in and really started becoming influential because it was like putting that record together quickly. Yeah, you mentioned paying the bills. I mean, yeah, it, it certainly, you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth, right? You, oh, uh, God, no, no. I was working at this Russian club to pay the bills. Yeah. And believe me, they paid some bills. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. Do you remember your first big paycheck? No. <laughs> you can't no. remember when you got that first check. Well, in. I just remember that I didn't, we didn't get paid for Tell It To My Heart. When you really do it, we got paid for a single, which I think it was like 17, 18 grand. We thought it was a lot of money, but, you know, we paid my father back, which basically, Tell It To My Heart cost me $6,000 to make. Mm. A lot we of told money. my dad, we signed off on a note, we'll pay you back, and he knew we would. We were hustlers, Rick and I, yeah. really. Well, he went on to uh, great success, but uh, uh, afterwards, too, I mean, but you were Absolutely. really the... You were the you were the artist that broke him out, and he went on and he worked oh, sure. with. Yeah, we did. Yeah. For those who don't know, we were talking about Rick Wake, and he, um, you know, he's had a hell of a success story too, right along with you, and you know, I heard uh, he came from Chicago originally. Am I right? Oh no no no. No, Rick not originally, but I mean, uh, he he came from Chicago to New York. Probably at that time, but I mean, he was nineteen. If anything, it's because he's a London boy. I mean, London. From Birmingham. He's yeah. A, he's a Brit, you know. How did you meet Young, him? He was 19, I was 21. And many a meal I bought him and his, his buddy, his partner. They were living in the basement at Bolin A Studios. Yeah. He just lived and breathed the studio, you know. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a hell of a story. It's a success story for sure. Uh, how did you meet him? I met him through a drummer I worked with in a band before. Um, I was passing out demo tapes from... The last band I was in, which was called The Next, and uh, I had done an audition through the Village Voice for a, a, a one-off because I was so sick of being in bands, and it was for a single, and I think it ended up being the single Touch Me. Samantha Fox ended up doing it. Oh, no kidding. It was for, through Jive Records, yeah. That's interesting. And when I got a call, and it was a British voice, I assumed it was from this because that was what the project was. It was British producer's. And it ended up being Rick, and Rick had heard my demo through this guy, Frank, who was the drummer in a band I was in, and uh, he told me he was working at the studio, at Bolognese Studios, and he worked on the Alicia record with one of the other producers, and that was all intriguing, and so we met, and he was just such a, a believer in me and my voice, and we became incredible friends and and just true leaders for each other, you know, just true, you know, band leaders for each other we couldn't praise each other enough and be there for each other it was an amazing friendship well it's a great partnership too you know you you have the voice and oh, he has the, without a doubt 
he has the production skills, and uh, you put the two of you together, and you, you made magic. That's for sure. Uh, we're we're yeah, speaking incredible year. Yeah, we're speaking with Taylor Dane. Taylor, the you mentioned the band The Next, and you you had a couple of other bands growing up. Any of those guys uh, or gals or whoever that were in those bands, or any of them uh, still out there in the music business? You know, I I couldn't tell you. Probably um, not, though, right? You know, I don't know. I couldn't I couldn't even begin to tell you. Once you take off, you just took off, and I had left that behind me anyway. I was doing again by then. I was doing solo. You know, I was already a solo artist and trying, you know, working on 12 inches and singles and, you know, the bands were 18, 19, 20. That was it. Done. How soon after Tell It To My Heart broke, how soon after that did you hit the road and how did you like the road? Wow. Well, once it broke, it broke in Europe first. I was never home. I was gone. That was it for the Russian nightclub. That was it. I was in Europe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I was in Europe the first six months. Country, two countries a day sometimes. I mean, it was just, talk about that overnight stardom, obviously, all those years of preparation and work and bands prior, but it was done. It was over. I was on the road, I think, the first single to album, 15 months. Hmm. The people that you were meeting at the, at, at let's say the Russian nightclub and, and people around there, I mean, they, they, I'm sure people in general hear it all the time. I'm, I'm getting a record deal. I'm going to be big. I'm going to be a big deal. Uh, did they believe you immediately when you said, Hey, this is, this is happening. I'm a, you know, I'm about to sign with Arister. I mean, or was there some doubt? I never in told them that, you, but you, they knew for sure I was serious because um, mark my words, the girl that was singing with me, I was called the white Russian, she was called the black Russian. In the Russian nightclubs, we became very good friends, Diane Jones. I said, Diane, I'm out of here. And the minute my record signs, I'm going. And we were great friends, and I said, I'm taking you with me. And that woman traveled the world with me. She was my best friend, she was my partner, and she was in my band for five years. And she went on to work with uh, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue on tour. Yeah. Listen, they knew I was serious. I don't know how you need, know it, but I've watched people that I mark my words. I look at them like Amber Heard and I go, that girl's going to break. That girl's going to be huge. And it just is. People, Some people, you just stay out of their way. And they offered me a couple of deals, the Russians, but... <laughs> right. Thank God you didn't take um, them. Yeah. I don't know if that was an offer I couldn't refuse, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I can imagine what the, uh, you know, what, what the atmosphere was like it around there. It was complicated there. over there. Yeah. I had a lot of love for them and a lot of, a lot of great relationships with them, and they taught me a lot. Let's let's talk about Clive uh, for a moment. He boy, he loves those big voices, you know. And you you got one of them, and you mm -hmm. and you've you've uh, deserve everything you get having a voice like that. But uh, but of course, Whitney yourself and uh, Aretha. And, I mean, he's he has a you know he has a track record uh, you know miles and miles long. Uh, what's uh, what's your impression of Clive Davis? Well, then of course, I, I mean Clive. You know, in my mind, you know, I visualized it. Not not Clive, per se, but those voices were coming through the radio and doing material that was just different. And it was awe-inspiring to have such a voice and be able to do it in three minutes and 40 seconds. And I was like, who's doing this? Who's doing this? Who's putting this music? Where, where is this coming from? That guy will get me. That guy will get me. Or that business, that, that label. And ultimately, that's where it's signed, you know? I mean, there is the power of your mind, you know? Sure. And uh, that was Clive. I mean, once he was in, you know, nothing could stop him. I mean, he was what the industry used to be. You know, there were these powerful people in these positions in these labels that really believed in the talent and the force of breaking records. I mean, records just don't break like that anymore, and artists generally don't but you know then you look at your Adele's and it happens Amy Winehouse you know they're there but it's not like it was obviously because the machinery and the the way the system is broke but I would say you know Clive is, is iconic because of his passion and commitment to the music you sound like you like the business a bit uh, you know you talk about you know the the work uh, that you and Rick were doing and the 
and the spec deals. You, you sound like you, you, you have at least some, well, you have a great understanding of it, and it sounds like you had it then, even before you broke. Uh, is, is, that, uh, is that accurate? Well, I did it very grassroots, where a lot of people start today, and ultimately where we're all back to. This, it, this is a real grassroots, you know, when you look at all social media, it's a grassroots phenomenon, you know, that puts the power back in people's hands. Um, yeah, I honestly, for good and for bad, the, the ugly and the beauty is what I had to go through. Ultimately, I've always had to be more self-managed and more contained. Nobody just picked me out of a, a barrel of hay and said, she's golden. I've always had a fight for what I wanted. Yeah. But I would think most stories are like that. I just never knew when to get out of the, my way because I always had to, like, come out there and roll my sleeves up. That's just a survival mechanism, you know? Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Is there anything now that that you know now and you understand now about the business that you, you wish you could turn around and, and maybe do it again and a little differently with the knowledge you got? Well, that that's absolutely a yes. But, again, that could keep you up many a night, and it has, but there are moments where... You just let the bliss, which you heard earlier, of those creative moments are what get you through when you can create magic like that, which is generally you're not looking at the business component of it. You're going for the passion and the creativity. I mean, that's when work and great work is achieved. You know, so many... You know, nobody can determine and predetermine that kind of success. I mean, I went for it. I went for it. I had a passion. I had an enthusiasm, and I had... a drive like nobody's business the rest you just got to put out in the universe and cross your fingers you know a lot of people uh, can never have the success that you've had and, and still uh, are having but one of the things that uh, that I find myself fascinated with is, you know a lot of younger artists whether they're you know the artists or actors or athletes uh, they have a hard time when they get this money and, and they just, you know, they blow it and they just go and they, you know, they get the bling now and they get the, um, you know, they have a posse around them and everything else. Uh, how were you? Were you, uh, were you, uh, you know, you're a young woman. I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you were excited yeah. about getting some money. Um, were you prepared for it? Were you prepared for the success? I don't know who can prepare you other than if you have the foundation with your family. I mean, this, this, or or how you're raised. Like, you know, some people are raised hand to mouth, meaning so they hold on to every dollar. Other ones get it and then they have to, because of their, the family around them, there's so many people leaning on them and leeching on them, they don't have a choice. I think it's all how you, and, rem and remember, where we got our money from then was from record sales. Where people get their money from now is from the branding of themselves. And there's a far reach, a far bigger reach, meaning they can do it through, you know, proactive, you know, through a, an acne medicine, a clothing line. I mean, these things were not available to us then. It also was not considered, you know, above board. We didn't do, you know, sponsors. You know, m more sports, you know, and the protect protection of athletes compared to musicians is night and day. Yeah. The unions that protect them and protect their finances and protect their agencies – you know, for us, it was, the numbers were astronomical. 15 to 20% of your gross earnings go to just a management. Then on top of that, 10% will go to an agency. I mean, the numbers are astronomical, and every individual artist has to fight differently to negotiate their deal. It's never been a properly unionized and protected union for the talent, ever. Well, that's a good Still point. Isn't. That's a, that's a very good point. I mean, the athletes have that protection. It's the only point. So whoever gets in trouble, it's because they're not protected by the actual union itself. This money goes in there, and there are so many, I mean, like in boxing, there are so many in vultures. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I, and more now, after... I mean, and then you have to, you know, pull up like the Joneses. It's not like you get in a jet paid for by, you know... You know, not only are you told to pay for the record you make, it's like a terrible banking deal. You know, you just, it's a, like a bad loan, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like telling Julia Roberts, we're going to give you a salary, but that salary is going to come out of the back end. It just doesn't work that way. Nobody's been as unprotected as 
recording artists. That's a, yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, the, the athletes would argue that they have, they have a, a, a shorter shelf life. I mean, they, uh, you know, they can only play for That's a little, true. little while. But they don't pay for their jet. They all go in there the same. They all have to wear the same thing. It's not like they have to go out there and create the entire image around them. The image is the team. Let me ask and you about... The team is yeah. back. You know, it's just a whole different financial institution. Yeah, no question. I'm not, these are all good points. Let me ask you about uh, recording. Uh, do you like the process of recording now compared to how it was? I mean, have you gotten into Pro Tools and, like, home studios at this point? That's a, oh, a thousand percent, and that's been going on for, you know, many years now. Um, and I love it. I've always loved recording. I mean, sometimes I just want to finish and go because it's a creative process, too. I mean... You go in there, you do it, but then you leave, and then you have an opportunity to think about it and then get in there. But then there's nothing like having a lyric sheet in your hand where you're really just channeling. You're just really a conduit. You know, it's just coming out naturally, and then you're like, 20 years later, that's the vocals you're using, or that's, you know, that's what we did. Those were our choices, and we stuck with them. That's amazing. You're making permanent, uh, you know, permanent implants or, or, or impressions, I should yeah. say. On, yeah. on things. What about performing? How are you on performing uh, now compared to how you were then? Well, I mean, that, that grows. Like, as you grow, that grows. And every experience you have goes into it. I would say performing is the vehicle that has really, you know, my touring is what has kept me out there many, many years. I mean, obviously, the recording process has completely changed for me. And having that opportunity to be in the mainstream, you know, it just is what it is. It's the nature of the, it's the ageism, you know, so to speak. But ultimately, as your audience grows and you see over time that, you know, you are the soundtrack to people's lives, you know, it's like no different than when you listened and were inspired and influenced by the artists that you chose at the time and anywhere you could be in the world. Like for me, it's like if I hear a certain song, it just takes me right back. That feeling that it's just so inside you know your your being that's how the impact of music is you know how, how many shows a year do you how many shows a year do you like to perform oh i don't really know but i mean if you add i, I can't think off the top of my head but i'm i'm on the road easily you know if, if i if i called it even more weekend warrior stuff you know i travel at least three four times a month yeah right right doing shows um but i would say you know the difficulty with traveling is the exact word itself. You're traveling. Um, you're constantly on the move. But I, I've gotten very used to that. Um, but there's nothing like connecting with an audience that's you, with you and specifically there for you, you know. I mean, to be able to, to do that music to your fans and to perform what you love to do. And it, there's nothing like that moment. Do you have children? I do. You, I have twins, boy and girl, Levi and Astaria, and they're ten. No kidding. Oh, that's a yeah. That's an yeah. interesting age. Have they figured yeah. out yet who their mother is? <laughs> Has it hit them oh, yet? They're ten. They're not two. Yeah. Hell <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they go online like everybody else, and there's yes, they they figured it out. They're very, they're very uh, very aware, excitable, and love it, and very involved in their own lives and music and making music, and very passionate. Do you see them following in your footsteps? Um, yes and no. I see them following in mine, but also doing theirs. But they're definitely passionate about music, no doubt about it. My you know, son's got quite an instrument. Yeah, what is he, uh, a vocalist? Yeah, he can sing, for sure. Well, that's interesting. I think a lot of people will be looking at him, too. Do they, uh, do they write at all? I mean, they're young, you know, are they... Yeah, I mean, yeah, he already asked me just the other day, Mom, I'm having difficulty. Yeah, I showed him a couple of apps, and, you know, obviously they're online a lot more uh, proficiently than I ever could be. Um, but, yeah, they're very interested in that, yes. And that's what I encourage them to do, more. I encourage my daughter to listen more and, get, and tune her ear, and I encourage them to write their material. Uh, being... Being twins, you know, you always hear the, and I, I haven't been around uh, twins all that much, but they, they talk about the bond that they have and the connection that they have. Do you, do you sense that in them? You don't have to sense it. It just is. It's yeah. It's insane. Where's I mean, Levi? Where's Astaria? Where's Levi? Where's Astaria? I'm like, can't you just move it? No. 
you're, I'm dropping one off for basketball. The other one runs with them. It's just, it is what it is. Wow. Who are Absolute. they? Who are they listening to? Do you want to say? I mean, like, what what type of music are the two of them listening to? Oh, it's just completely top forty done. And of course, you know, look, they have my playlist. So I'm trying to think what song they like. Sometimes they'll just bust out a song, and, and it's just pieces. Like he was singing uh, Michael Jackson yesterday. Um, I'll, um, be there in the morning. You know, um, be there in the morning. Yeah, he was right. got to be there. I was like, where did you go? Oh, it's on the, you know, it's on the iPod. Okay. You know, it's, it seems like every station, every every network, major network, has their own singing contest now between, you know, American Idol yeah. and the X Factor and all the, uh, you know, how would you have liked that um, growing up, you know, have something like that? Do you think you would have liked that process? I don't know. I just think, you know, it's just telling of the times, you know, it's immediate. It's there. It's difficult for these artists. Obviously, very few of them have gone on to have much success. It, the process itself is in a, in an eight-week program, you know, so it's like, you, you know, it's difficult. But the ones that work, that work. But it shows you the power of TV, the power of the medium of television, and the power of direct, you know, it's almost like a direct sale to your audience. It shows you more, on the other side, the type of the, the talent that they're pulling in on the judging table. I mean, it just shows you that this is the way people, this is the new way of people breaking music, staying in people's, you know, uh, mindset and, 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 you know, really promoting yourself. You know, we had... And having a good time, you know, and, and honestly, the format, the medium of it, the medium of it. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. The, a while ago, we had Corey Rooney on as a guest, you know, the, the great producer. I'm sure he sold over 100 million records between J-Lo and 50 Cent and, and everyone else. And I, I asked him, I said, what do you what do you think about the uh, shopping process now compared to what it was? And he said, Frank, there's no shopping process anymore. It's it's YouTube or it's one of these singing contests yeah. or whatever, and they just take off. I mean, you, you, do you want to comment on that? Well, he's right. I mean, look. Justin Bieber, perfect example, picked right up off YouTube. Um, you know, Justin Timberlake chooses his artist at their production. You know, in their production, and anybody else, that who gets the most traction is the one that starts getting people to blow around it. Nobody can risk losing jobs. Nobody can risk saying yes. It's very, it's very. You know, it's it's. You put the artist in with the great producer, and the producer's just as, if not more influential than the talent, and. Because they're they're creating this these records unless the kid happens to be a writer or producer. I mean, is these are the components. But it's not that it wasn't different then. It just kind of wasn't. But the reality was, in my day, there was a machine. We always liked the machine, the machine. Look, there is a machine still. There are labels that exist. It's just the machine relies so heavily on the other machine. So it's always been a catch-22. But now, it's like, who needs the machine? The machine is in your hands. It's YouTube. It's, you know, used to be MySpace. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's Facebook. It's followers, you know. It's your ability to network yourself. Put it out there and get followers. I mean, it's a different world. And I mean, build it, and they will come. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a good point. I mean, uh, when you and Rick were making records, you're... you're you were basically uh, getting two-inch tape, getting three songs on these uh, on these two-inch uh, expensive. T you know, True. certainly at the time. But again, I'm as I'm as close to this YouTube generation for what was going on then as ever. We did 12 inches. I was breaking. I was doing it through the clubs, and I was also doing it through the mix stations. And basically, so this isn't uncommon for me. I used the tools that we had at the time to correct to break. Yeah. Without having to get the machine, the machine came because I built it. It's a it's an interesting point. Uh, how do how about your kids? Are they um, or your daughter? Is she a Justin Bieber fan? Uh, yeah, I think she is now. But you know, anything you know, look, Top Rihanna, four. there's such great pop talent and music out there now. It's it's to me, I love it. I mean, that's everything from the Kelly Clarksons to the Ushers to the you know Rihanna, Katy Perry. I mean, these kids paint. They're just writing, producing, and continuing. I mean, it's great material. Great songs, great pop music. Do I mean, you... that's the influence of Europe. You know that the whole EDM stuff. You know the electronica stuff is. This is this is 
you know, once it got out of that whole urban trend, it really is. I mean, these urban artists are making, you know, electronica dance music with strong hooks. That's the power of David Guetta, Calvin Harris, you know. Yeah. I, you know, you have a healthy... But they're writing great songs. It, it sounds like you have a healthy uh, attitude towards the modernization of uh, of music, you know, a lot of a lot of people. And again, it, it's just a couple years ago, but I mean, you know, you're you're you know an elder states person of of the yep. music business, and I, I wonder if the uh, the newer people uh, that are coming in there, the you know the twenty year olds and the, you know the singing contest winners and all of them, I, I wonder if they realize what the what the Taylor Danes and the Whitney Houston's and the uh, you know Cindy Lauper came out right around the same time as you and, and different people like that, you, you know what they you know what they had to, and and I don't mean in a, in a sense of appreciation for the battle that you kind of paved the way, but I, I wonder if they, if they're students of the game. You know, you sound like you are, and I wonder if if they are. And and you know, I'm sure it's different uh, individual by individual, but uh, you know, all of the you know the YouTubes and and everything else. I mean, these, these are these are gifts from God. I mean, if you're a you're an artist, I mean, you, uh, Pro Tools. You know, every kid in the every kid in the world could could be his own record producer, and it's you know it's not costing right. him a lot of money. I mean, uh, are you sensing that? Do you get do you get from younger artists uh, them picking your brain, uh, you know, asking you questions about it, or do you think they they know it all? They got it all in their hands. Well, I don't know. I'm not in the studio every day as a producer, where I would be, you know, directly. Um, in contact with kids picking my brain that way. I will say that once somebody has made the decision to become an artist, they'd be, a, you know, I've met, you know, arrogant, you know, creators, and I've met people that are complete students of the game. I mean, I think it's definitely personalized, but once you've made it a, a complete career, you'd be foolish not to look at anything and be open. I've met the most open and just, like, people in awe and I'm like really they're like Taylor forget it look at this look at this history or the ones that are like oh yeah man I know that I know that I know that I know that oh yeah 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 I get it I get it you know it's just it's very individualized you know going back to your career what was the turning point in your life or if you prefer what was the turning point in your career well I mean the obvious is the release and the break you know, the breakout, you know, tell it to my heart. That was the beginning. How about before that? What what changed your your whole mindset on music in order to get you to that point? Um, before that. Maybe meeting Rick, it? right? I mean, the combination of... I music. would say Rick and I really, the bond we had and then, you know, but it wouldn't have changed if we were unsuccessful, but that was a great collaboration. One of those, those great, you know, that, that was the partner, you know. Are you still in touch? We haven't been for the last few years, but we, we've gone in and out of seeing each other. I think he's moved multiple times, you know. Yeah. But not, not recently. No. Where do you go from here? I mean, you look up in, in your room and, and I'm sure, you know, the kids see all your gold and platinum records and all this you know, there's, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, any any stone left uh, unturned, at least musically, on, on your end. What what do you do with your Taylor Dane? Where do you go from here? Well, you know, this year marks my 25th year in the business. So what you do is you do what you do best. You tour, you stay creative, and then you look at the next 25 years and you say, what? How do I look at this differently? How do I look at, you know? my career now in the different light and how do I make new music and how do I stay creative and true to myself and at the same time have an impact because anything you do creatively as an artist if there is no audience to hear it it's it's really not art it has to be produced it has to be produced so people can hear it and judge it and be a part of it then it's creative then it's music it's being heard so that's my job you mentioned 25 years. Uh, that's that's also the yardstick uh, that uh, starts up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Do you expect to be elected? And uh, and and uh, do you I don't care know about that? Do you care I, one way or the other? Of course, I care one way or the other. It'd be 18 top 10 hits in Billboard. I mean, it would be nice. It's just, you know, who knows? 
Hey, I hate hate to tell you, there are a lot of people in that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that that, that can, <laughs> career wise, forget about talent. You got tremendous talent, but but the the amount of gold records you have, uh, you know, couldn't uh, couldn't hold a candle to to your career uh, statistic wise. So I mean, I uh, you know why? Uh, True. Why would some people just they could have won and they were just such an impact? I don't know. You know that, that's again getting into the the club. Sometimes you can get in and sometimes you can't. Yeah, don't you're know. you're really not right. You're not that clicky. You don't. You know, I didn't read about you much in the. Not that I read the tabloids, but I didn't hear about you much in the tabloids. There was no big Taylor Dane scandals and different things like you know. These. No, no scandals, and I probably didn't sleep with some of the. <laughs> right. you know, some of the people you should have. Some, right. some of the I'm right sure people. I slept with the Kennedy this week, but <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So we're under the radar, but yeah. then we didn't have you know this type of. We just didn't have that PR machine, meaning, and we also didn't have the paparazzi here. That was all in Europe. This thing's a much bigger phenomenon here the last 10 years. No, it's a 24-hour news cycle is, uh, uh, is yeah, upon well, us. Yeah, it just didn't exist when, you know, in the 80s, uh, up, you know, that came along in the, we started with the Britney Spears stuff, you know, that was 98, 99. But I imagine it gives you some privacy, too. I mean, you... Since you didn't get that kind of attention, I mean, you, you got a lot of respect. I mean, there, uh, you know, I, th I think more than you uh, you probably even realize. But your voice is just it, it, yeah. It, no, I understand that. Yeah. It's great. You got a tremendous amount of respect, but you're not that you're not that um, you know tabloid star. And maybe uh, maybe right. it's not a bad maybe maybe you figured out the perfect balance either indirectly or directly you figured out the per perfect balance. I imagine you could walk into a store and, and walk out without being surrounded either, right? Yep, that is absolutely true. That's nice when you there's have twin ten year olds. To that, there's a lot of blessings and in in, in, in in this world, there's a lot of curses with it because ultimately that affects your bottom end. Yeah. Because that's what people want. Anyway, Taylor Dane has been our special guest. Uh, Taylor, anything you want to add? Uh, website? Uh, you want to plug a website? or? Uh, oh, goodness. Yeah, follow me on Twitter, uh, Taylor underscore Dane, D-A-Y-N-E. Obviously, my Taylor Dane uh, official site and everything, you know, Facebook, it's all linked. Everything's all over. Look for my tour dates, and it's really an honor. This, this has been an inc incredible year. I've been being honored in all these lights it's, it's wonderful i really appreciate it thank you all well thank you thanks for being here and thank you for listening everybody this has been frank mckay with taylor jane on turning point we'll see you all next week turning point with frank mckay was produced by out of the box studios in bohemia new york executive producers frank mckay harry oates and bart pellegrino Director of Operations, Corey Arnold. Segment Producer and Talent Coordinator, Kristen McKay. Audio and Studio Engineer, Francis Kazmarek and Tom Shazam. Studio Support, Mark Harwood, Pete Galgano, Brian Hunt, Danielle Altabrando, Keith Withers, and Chris Lou. Sound Mixing and Mastering, Daniel Joseph. Hotel Accommodations provided by Ohika Castle, Hotel and Estate in Huntington, New York. Transportation Services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hopoff, New York. Catering Services provided by Windows on the Lake in Ronkonkoma, New York. <laughs> I was in Europe. Yeah. I mean, I think I was in Europe the first six months. Country, two countries a day sometimes. I mean, it was just, talk about that overnight stardom, obviously, all those years of preparation and work and bands prior, but it was done. It was over. I was on the road, I think, the first single to album, 15 months. Hmm. The people that you were meeting at the, at, at let's say, the Russian nightclub and, and people around there, I mean, they, they, I'm sure people in general hear it all the time. I'm, I'm getting a record deal. I'm going to be big. I'm going to be a big deal. Uh, did they believe you immediately when you said, hey, this is, this is happening? I'm, a, you know, I'm about to sign with Arista. I mean, or is there some doubt? I never in told them that. But you, you, they knew for sure I was serious because, um, mark my words, the girl that was singing with me, I was called the white Russian. She was called the black Russian. In the Russian nightclubs, we became very good friends. Diane Jones. I said, Diane, I'm out of here. And the minute my record signs, I'm going. And we were great friends, and I said, I'm taking you with me. That woman traveled the world with me. She was my best friend. She was my 
partner, and she was in my band for five years. And she went on to work with uh, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue on tour. Yeah, listen, they knew I was serious. I don't know how you need, know it, but I've watched people that I mark my words. I look at them like Amber Heard, and I go, that girl's going to break, that girl's going to be huge. And it just is. People, Some people, you just stay out of their way. And they offered me a couple of deals, the Russians, but... <laughs> right. Thank God you didn't take um, them. Yeah. I don't know if that was an offer I couldn't refuse, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I can imagine what the, uh, you know, what, what the atmosphere was like yeah, around there. It was there. complicated over there. Yeah. I had a lot of love for them and a lot of, a lot of great relationships with them, and they taught me a lot. Let's let's talk about Clive uh, for a moment. He boy, he loves those big voices, you know. And you you got one of them, and you mm. and you've you've uh, deserve everything you get having a voice like that. But uh, but of course, Whitney yourself and uh, Aretha. And, I mean, he's he has a you know he has a track record uh, you know miles and miles long. Uh, what's uh, what's your impression of Clive Davis? Well, then of course, I, I mean Clive. You know, in my mind, you know, I visualized it. Not not Clive, per se, but those voices were coming through the radio and doing material that was just different. And it was awe-inspiring to have such a voice and be able to do it in three minutes and 40 seconds. And I was like, who's doing this? Who's doing this? Who's putting this music? Where is this coming from? That guy will get me. That guy will get me. Or that business, that, that label. And ultimately, that's where it's signed. You know, I mean, there is the power of your mind. You know, sure. And uh, that was Clive. I mean, once he was in, you know, nothing could stop him. I mean, he was what the industry used to be. You know, there were these powerful people in these positions in these labels that really believed in the talent and the force of breaking records. I mean, records just don't break like that anymore, and artists generally don't but you know then you look at your Adele's and it happens Amy Winehouse you know they're there but it's not like it was obviously because the machinery and the the way the system is broke but I would say you know Clive is is iconic because of his passion and commitment to the music you sound like you like the business a bit uh, you know you talk about you know the the work uh, that you and Rick were doing and the and the spec deals. You, you sound like you, you you have at least some, uh, well, you have a great understanding of it, and it sounds like you had it then. I ended up at uh, um, ultimately Cove City, but I started out of a little studio and met Rick Wake. Um, was that Rick Beater's studio? In Merritt. Was there, was there a guy named Rick Beater? I'm sorry? Is that the right, well, maybe Lou Bolognese's studio. Was that, was it? Yes, that was, yes, that was, yes. Now, it, let me ask you, what exactly were you? What it was. What were you singing in, in the Russian uh, nightclubs? What type of music were you singing? Uh, well, top 40 at the time, but and that was uh, basically, you know, so foreign to me because I was doing so much original music ultimately. But honestly, I was also singing a lot of Russian songs. I was right, learning so them phonetically. I'd studied uh, uh, classically in my two years of college and was really working with a, a classical meaning operatic uh, coach, I really felt that that would be a fundamentally um, challenging and also protective way to preserve my voice by having that background, and it was. And I had the instrument for it. I was a mezzo-soprano. And uh, so that was behind the scenes. But ultimately, this my my coach, who I ended up taking off, was Maestro Corelli. He was... Uh, at the Manhattan School of Music and ultimately at the uh, Met. And that's his career, but he would come to many a club and watch me perform. <laughs> hey, kind of funny. Yeah, oh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, we kind of started at 16. What if we go way back? What was the first record you remember hearing and singing and, uh, you know, really the first influence you had? Well, my biggest influence were my parents, meaning that, you know, music was played in the home. And it was usually on Sundays when, you know, my father was home and he was cooking breakfast or brunch, we call it. And it was a lot of musicals, Man of La Mancha, The Fantastics. And and they really were influential in giving me my first records, you know, 45s at, at the time. 
and giving me my first radio. My dad did. Um, and we were, they were big, you know, avid theater goers, my parents, truly. And like real, you know, off Broadway. Yeah. To, you know, off, off Broadway, which, and they introduced me to a lot of musical theater, which I despised at the time. Yeah. I just didn't, couldn't wrap my head around it. And it just seemed such a, I said, everybody's trying too hard, Mom, trying too, too hard. <laughs> Uh, but they showed me some very interesting productions. We'd go to La Mama. We'd go to, uh, you know, the Pap Theater. And there I saw incredible, like, from Les Mis to, you know, Ain't Misbehaving to Liz Suedos to, you know, Mehmet. I mean, it was just interesting. And, again, they were the most influential. And they bought me my first 45s or my first albums, which were the Beatles, the Stones, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Which of all, I would say, Crosby, Stills, and Nash is the one that hit home the most with the harmonies and the vocal prowess. And and then my first 45, I think, was probably Build Me Up Buttercup and Foundation. Yeah. What instruments did you play, if any? <laughs> I was in the marching band. I was It was flute. Yeah. And I played a little guitar, but that was it. Well, the flute, how much, uh, you know, how much preparation did that give you at least breath wise right I, I don't know the instrument but I imagine well, I I wasn't really good at cold reading and stuff like that but I had this incredible ear so I guess more improvisational so by the time we were doing like jazz band and stuff I was doing much better doing improvisational performing so we're here technically yeah I'm sorry so good. yeah we're here with Taylor Dane uh, Taylor at, at one point Clive Davis hears you and I know we're missing a lot of material in between, but when Clive Davis hears you and and flips out on you, uh, or over you, I should say, uh, good things are bound to happen. you want to lead us to that? Well, basically at that point, I've been working with Rick for a year or so. We, um, a lot of stories, you know, ha coming upon Tell It To My Heart, which was uh, given to me on a cassette with a, a bunch of other songs from a friend of mine that I went to high school with at Warner Chapel and a friend of his, Warner Chapel Publishing. Rick chooses Tell It to My Heart. We go and sit down with my dad. I've done a couple of 12 inches by then under Leslie. And we go, this is the song we feel is really good and at least, you know, or the one that at least can cross over and, you know, lend us some money, you know, we'll pay you back and we'll get on the mix shows at least. And I can go around and, you know, do some of these clubs and Form. We, we, we thought we'd get over in the mix shows at least. And ultimately, that's the single that we were trying to use as the leverage to get potentially some, inf you know, some whatever to get out with, you know. Potentially the mix shows, meaning the radio stations would pick it up in the midnight specials, you know, when they're playing those. But ultimately, it got walked into Arista Records through a guy named Andy Furman, who a produced, a, basically, we hired a um, a PR, a, a pup, you know, whatever you want to call him. Yeah, um, a promoter. To uh, work the record and the dance level. But he w gave it to somebody at Arista, and Arista had Clive hear it. And I was signed. We They made an offer on, uh, you know, on Tell It To My Heart, which <laughs> really, it was signed. Uh, we, it got passed by a couple of labels, but this particular label, which is Arista, was the home of Whitney and, and really doing incredible stuff with, more of Aretha because Aretha grew, broke out with whom, Zoom, and Who, and that was a real top 40 success. But it was Clive, ultimately Clive Aris Records, that heard Tell It To My Heart and signed it for a single, single option album with me. So they released it with no photo on the cover, just the language of Tell It To My Heart and mm. funny cover, and they released it in Europe first, and it just blew up. I mean, it's one of those stories. It's just you can't, you know, rewrite it. It's exactly what happened. It blew up, and nobody saw it coming. And they had no record in the can. They had nothing. And I was just like, gonna, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Clive met me or heard me sing live and was like, this is the most outstanding voice. They had a single. They bought it for kind of nothing. And so it was blowing up, and they had no album in the can. Because, you know, there's only so far you can go on singles. It's albums that... Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. And that's when the real story begins. I was just going to ask you, how much material did you have backing you up after that? I mean, 
you, did you have, uh, you know, residue from your old bands, or was that usable? Or No. Basically, during, you know, for a, a couple of years, Rick and I have been in the studio playing, but, you know, I met a bunch of songwriters and writers, and the same writer of Tell It My Heart we ultimately used for the second single, which was Prove Your Love. Seth Sawarski and Ernie Roman and just goes on. But yeah. And I had worked with another uh, writer, um, and she was one of the writers on Don't Rush Me, because I was doing a lot of session work, you know, paying some bills. But yeah. I'll Always Love You and then the rest, you know, putting the album together was a real quick, and, you know, that's when Clive came in and really started becoming influential because it was like putting that record together quickly. Yeah, you mentioned paying the bill. The most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. Taylor Dane is this week's guest on Turning Point with Frank McKay. People throughout the world have been enjoying Taylor's music for more than two decades. She talks with Frank about those pivotal moments that led to her success and how people like Clive Davis changed the course of her career. She also talks about her other great love, being a mom to her 11-year-old twins. Let's listen. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome. Today, our very special guest is the very talented, the always intriguing Taylor Dane. Taylor, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. I, good morning to you. We're <laughs> we're always uh, always interested in the business of music, and you, you had a, a really fascinating start. You really started, you know, from ground floor up. And if if my my facts are right and my memories are right, you, you're from Long Island, New York, where I'm from as well. And yeah. is that right? Yes, I am. Yes, yeah. I grew up in Baldwin and Freeport, yes. And, uh, you know, I hear all the, the stories, and you're really, you know, quite a legend when you get around here because your story and your rise uh, really was a, a fascinating one. You, you had worked at, out of some smaller studios, and then uh, from what I understand, you did a, 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 a spec deal with uh, Cove City, and that's what led to, you know, the, the Clive Davis deal. But let me let you tell it in your words. Uh, go back to the beginning, if you would. Well, I mean, I graduated, uh, I was in high school in Baldwin, and um, all that, all my elementary school and whatever I was in, I, I was extremely focused, hyper-focused that this was my career. You know, I want to be a rock and roll star, if you will. Um, I was a singer. Um, elementary school, I had my solos and certain parts, and I was very determined to break in the music industry. Uh, coming from New York, you know, we had our, our stations of the PLJs, the KTUs, and, you know, I grew up listening to ABC Radio, you know, which was as top 40 as it gets. It was a big deal back AM. then. Yeah, big deal back then. It's different. Absolutely. It was huge. Um, and it was everything in our radio station from, you know, the Karen Carpenters, the Temptations, to the Al Greens, you know, the Marvin Gaye's. That was top 40, you know, to Three Dog Night or Aerosmith even. I was a, you know, big product of the early 70s, you know, 70s. That was radio for me. Um, so for me, I really was quite determined. So I was in my first band at 16, um, was covers and things like that, probably Neil Young to Almond Brothers, whatever, but um, graduating high school, um, my first band. So we were playing... It was all original music, which was kind of a, you know, probably a new concept, but the point was that was what it was. So I was going in and out of the city. We were working in our, you know, as I said, my, my first band. So already we were looking for record contracts and trying to make noise because we were, or at least the main writers were really trying to uh, get showcases and really break. So I was doing that at 17, 18 and getting introduced to a lot of the, you know, the clubs that would, would potentially be the, uh, the grounds, you know, for a groundbreaking band, you know. And that led to the CBGBs and all that. And a couple of bands by the time I was, I guess, 20 and working in a Russian nightclub down in Brighton Beach just, you know, to pay bills, I somehow I ended up. I mean, yeah, it's it certainly, you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. 
Right, you, oh, uh, God, no, no. I was working at this Russian club to pay the bills. Yeah. And believe me, they paid some bills. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. Do you remember your first big paycheck? No. <laughs> you can't no. remember when you got that first check. Well, in. I just remember that I didn't, we didn't get paid for Tell It To My Heart. When you really do it, we got paid for a single, which I think it was like 17, 18 grand. We thought it was a lot of money, but, you know, we paid my father back, which basically... Tell it to my heart cost me six thousand dollars to make. Mm. A lot we of money. My dad, we signed off on a note. We'll pay you back, and he knew we would. We were hustlers, Rick and I. Yeah. Really. Well, he went on to uh, great success, but uh, uh, afterwards too. I mean, but you were really Absolutely. the you were the you were the artist that broke him out, and he went on and he worked oh, sure. with. Yeah, we did. Yeah. For those who don't know, we were talking about Rick Wake, and he, um, uh, you know, he's had a hell of a success story too, right along with you. And, you know, I heard uh, he came from Chicago originally. Am I right? Oh, no, no, no. No, Rick not originally, but, I mean, uh, he he came from Chicago to New York? Probably at that time, but, I mean, he was 19. If anything, it's because he's a London boy. I mean, London, from Birmingham. He's yeah. A, he's a Brit, you know. How did you meet Young, him? He was 19. I was 21. And many a meal I bought him and his, his buddy, his partner. They were living in the basement at Bolognese Studios. Yeah. He just lived and breathed the studio, you know? Yeah, well, that's a, it's a hell of a story. It's a success story for sure. Uh, how did you meet him? I met him through a drummer I worked with in the band before. Um, I was passing out demo tapes from the last band I was in, which was called The Next. And uh, I had done an audition through the Village Voice for a, a, a one-off because I was so sick of being in bands. And it was for a single, and I think it ended up being the single Touch Me. Samantha Fox ended up doing it. Oh, no kidding. It was for, through Jive Records, yeah. That's interesting. And when I got a call, and it was a British voice, I assumed it was from this, because that was what the project was. It was British producers. And it ended up being Rick, and Rick had heard my demo through this guy, Frank, who was the drummer in a band I was in. And uh, he told me he was working at a studio, at Bolognese Studios, and he worked on... The Alicia record with one of the other producers, and that was all intriguing. And so we met, and he was just such a, a believer in me and my voice, and we became incredible friends and and just true leaders for each other. You know, just true, you know, band leaders for each other. We couldn't praise each other enough and be there for each other. It was an amazing friendship. Well, it's a great partnership too. You know, you you have the voice, and oh, he has the without a doubt. He has the production skills, and uh, you put the two of you together, and you, you made magic. That's for sure. Uh, we're we're yeah, speaking. Incredible year. Yeah, we're speaking with Taylor Dane. Taylor, the you mentioned the band, the Next, and you you had a couple of other bands growing up. Any of those guys uh, or gals or whoever that were in those bands, or any of them uh, still out there in the music business? You know, I I couldn't tell you. Probably um, not, though, right? You know, I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't even begin to tell you. Once you take off, you just took off, and I had left that behind me anyway. I was doing, again by then, I was doing solo. You know, I was already a solo artist and trying. You know, working on twelve inches and singles, and you know, the bands were eighteen, nineteen, twenty. That was it. Done. How soon after "Tell It to My Heart" broke? How soon after that did you hit the road? And how did you like the road? Wow, well, once it broke, it just broke in Europe first. I was never home. I was gone. That was it for the Russian nightclub. That was 